You are listening to ESL Talk, a podcast made for English teachers by English teachers. Here are your hosts, Daniel and Golnaz. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third episode of ESL Talk. I'm Golnaz. Uh, it's Daniel here.、Uh, today, we're going to talk about technology for effective teaching, why it can be useful, and how we can use it. In and out of the classroom for a better teaching and learning experience. We also have Kelsey with us today. She's an ESL teacher and a teacher trainer currently working in Turkey. We are going to have a chat with her about technology and how it can affect our teaching. Yeah, really looking forward to that. So, first, let's take a look at why we need technology. Does quality teaching really depend on it, or is it just an addition to teaching? Well, The first thing that comes to mind is that you can use PowerPoint presentations or g i p h y or different kinds of visual aids to transform the course books into something, you know, more lively and engaging for your students. And well, it also makes learning easier and more fun. This is the first basic thing that technology does for us. Absolutely. And plus, with face to face classes, Pretty much universally being online now all around the world. You know, as teachers, we need to cope, we need to adapt and learn more about using different tools to make the most out of our experience. And also, what's important with technology now is that we're comfortable and that we're kind of, you know, feeling able to use it in the right way for our learners because, as we've mentioned previously, our learners always have different needs and maybe different language abilities. So, knowing our learners and knowing how to use the technology for them. Is really important. Now, what options do we have? Because there is a lot of different options, and we're just going to discuss a few for you now. Well, we can start with talking about the platforms that we use to you know,、uh, hold our classes online, like Zoom, like Microsoft Teams, or Google Classrooms. One thing that、um, I Uh, personally,、uh, find interesting about these platforms is that、uh, different teachers and different learners、uh, find each one of these uh, platforms um, useful in a different way. Some people are more comfortable with one of them, some people are you know, more comfortable with the other. So,、um, about using these platforms,、uh, something that we have to take into consideration is. Our needs, our learners' needs, and you know, the type of the、um, class actually, and the type of the, you know, how everything is going to go. Maybe for some sessions, you might be more comfortable with Zoom, and for some sessions, you might be more comfortable with Microsoft Teams, for example. Or you might、uh, go and like blend these、uh, and, you know, use different platforms. That's really, that really depends on、uh, you as a teacher and also your learners. Yeah, definitely. I know some teachers will just kind of say, oh, let's use Zoom because that's the most popular. And that might not be what's best for you and your learners. And, you know, personally, I use Teams a lot, and a lot of students don't really like Teams, but there are some tools and there are some functionalities on there that are a little bit,、um, you know, difficult to use at first. But once you get used to them, there is a lot of, you know, improvements and、um, advantages over Zoom. Um, the main thing for Teams is probably security, and a lot of institutions want security. But if you're teaching independently online just by yourself, then Zoom might be a good option. And then we also have a lot of、um, learning management systems or LMSs, which you can incorporate into your classes and your teaching. So、um, a lot of websites now offer kind of you know, plugins or add ons where you can put in courses or you can put in videos or you can incorporate those into your,、uh, into your teaching.、Um, so we're looking at things like、um, I believe there is a really useful tool that、uh, I'm actually working with at the moment called Learn Dash, where it is simply just for learning.、Um, my students also use something called Agora, which is an online platform where they can go in and complete activities, videos, quizzes, etc. And one that、uh, we might hear a little bit more about later is something called Padlet, where you get your resources, you get your materials, and you incorporate that into、um, a quiz or a really short kind of、uh, Cue card or flashcard activity.、Um, and that also can be a really useful platform to use as well. So, for websites and website resources,、um, what are some useful websites that English teachers could take advantage of on this? Well, there are millions of websites out there that we can all use,、uh, depending on、uh, you know, our plans and our needs. But, like, 
To name a few, we can say Breaking News English, Listen and Write, Duolingo, IELTS Mini. These are all very useful resources. Um, Daniel, would you want to share a little bit more details on these websites? Yeah, I mean, as you said, there's so many good resources out there for English learners, and it just depends on what specific skill or what kind of English we're teaching for our learners. So um, you mentioned Breaking News English. You know, that's quite a low-tech, very simple solution. So depending on where you are, if, you know, maybe your students or yourself, you know, you don't have the best internet connection, that's a really nice a tool for students to use because it gives them relevant, up-to-date news articles where they can read at their level. They can do comprehension activities, questions, checking. You can discuss things. So that's a really good tool that I would always suggest for reading and uh, also speaking as well. Uh, the next one is listen and write. Why do I love this? Because you can choose videos, you can choose podcasts, you can choose little clips. You can listen to the specific words and specific vocabulary being spoken, and you have to write what you hear. Now, it's essentially transcribing, but that is a really you know, amazing tool for improving your accuracy in listening and your accuracy in writing and you know, um, building your vocabulary as well. So listen and write is fantastic for that. Um, as you may know, a lot of students now are studying for the IELTS, and it's really difficult to get good IELTS materials and good IELTS um, resources, you know, practice exams, etc. Um, IELTS Mini is one that I would really suggest, or Mini IELTS. I, I think the URL is maybe a little bit flipped, but this is a really great resource because it's very authentic, it's very interactive, and it's set out in a really easy to manage way. So the interface is really clear. Um, so this is great for listening and for reading um, for IELTS because writing, speaking, there's lots of materials, but specifically for listening and for reading, you can get practice tests, you can go through the process, so you build the skills that you need for that. Um, so those are just a few website resources, um, but one more that I love and I really like to incorporate as much as possible into my English classes is Youglish. So, Golnas, have you heard of Youglish? Mm, no, no, I haven't heard about that. So, Youglish, obviously, if you listen to it, it's like YouTube and English combined. So, you know, native speakers, we use a lot of very maybe unusual or strange phrases or slang words or, you know, colloquial terms, idioms. And for non-native speakers, it can be really difficult for them to understand. Um, so, for example, you know, people in English, we might not say, hello, how are you? We might say, are you okay? Or are you all right? And other people might think, why, why are you asking me if I'm all right? Why are you asking me if I'm okay? So you can get phrases like that. We can put them into English and then we can set, do we want US English? Do we want UK English? Do we just want everything? And what that, what that tool will do, it's essentially a search engine that will bring up specific videos, specific clips, specific you know, little nuggets of five seconds, 10 seconds of speech, where I can hear that naturally being used. It could be from a TV show like Friends. It could be from an academic lecture. So I would always suggest for students and also for teachers as well, uh, maybe if you're not comfortable with all of these different technical um, idiomatic phrases and, uh, you know, different slang terms to use Youglish. I think that's a really fantastic resource. And also, it's a lot of fun as well. <laughs> So those are just a few websites that we can use with our learners um, to help them interact more and to kind of develop and extend their skills. So let's move on now to talk about interactive games and activities. What are some interactive games and activities that we could suggest for our listeners? Well, we can use Kahoot. We can use Quizlet to main uh, resources that we can use to, you know, create something interactive. My own experience with Kahoot has been um, really interesting because you can use it for teaching, you can use it for testing, you can use it for just casual games, uh, you can use it for practice. So it's it's really um, you can do magic with it. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually, you need to have an account, and for some services, you need to kind of upgrade. But it is really worth it because uh, it gives you a lot of different tools. It lets you um, design your lesson or your quiz the way you want it to, and the good thing is that um, you have the screen, you share your screen, and then uh, the students use their cell phones and then, um, you know, to answer the questions or to participate in the activities. This is really fun. 
uh, number one, it's really fun. Students always love it. Um, you know, uh, the fact that uh, sometimes, you know, some students are really competitive and they want to compete. And um, th that's a whole atmosphere of, you know, gaming in the class and then having um, some results at the end to see who was first or was second. That can be, uh, I mean, if moderately managed, that can be really fun. Also, um, I used Kahoot for my um, exams because sometimes uh, the students don't like exams, taking exams, and they, it's it's too formal. It, I mean, it usually has been too formal, and it's like a okay, a piece of paper, or I don't know. Um, you just use different platforms today uh, for online tests and uh, online exams. But if you want to change that a little bit, and if you want to, you know, jazz it up a little bit, and you want to make it a little bit more casual and informal for your students to feel more comfortable uh, you can just put your questions there and then for example set the timing um, accordingly and then uh, have everyone participate in it and tell them that okay this is going to be your exam this is going to be your test but don't worry about it this is like what we have done always in the classroom so they might feel a little bit you know more comfortable with it yeah, definitely. And Kahoot is a great tool just for getting students a comprehension, checking, um, just to make sure that they have understood and that they can actually start to lead their own learning as well. And yeah, you brought up this, this kind of idea of competition or gamification, and that's a really new concept in online teaching of gamifying and making things as, you know, fun and interactive like that. So I think you know, using interactive games and activities like Kahoot can be great because, as you said, students can see, okay, I got this right, I got this wrong. It doesn't have to be super serious. And if students make errors or mistakes, they don't feel quite as, you know, uncomfortable or, um, you know, offended maybe. So I think that's a really useful tool. And yeah, making things interactive like that is, is really fantastic. Um, we also mentioned briefly before Padlet, Quizlet, they're kind of the same tool where we put things into flashcards and it's just a nice way to break down lessons, instructions, uh, content, so that it's easier for students to digest. So those are two, just two. Um, there's a lot more, but we obviously you know, can't talk about every single one, but those are just two main ones that I think could be really useful as well. Um, so coming on to this, in terms of for us as teachers, what are some organizational tools? What are some tools that we can use to organize our lessons, organize our students, organize our calendar, and so on, Golnes? Again, only to name a few. We can mention Trello. We can mention Calendly or Mentimeter. These are all um, useful tools that help us get organized and also get organized with our you know, learners, the things that we receive from them to check, to get give feedback, receive feedback. And would you want to go into more details about them? Absolutely. So yeah, the first tool for organization and organizing yourself is Trello. So Trello is fantastic because it's one landing page and you can share this page with your students. So let's say I have five students that I'm teaching for my online English business and perhaps you know, I want to make sure that they're set in the same way. So I'm starting my week. Okay, Monday, student A is going to do this, this, and this. Student B is going to do this, 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 and this because they have an extra lesson. Uh, student C is going to just do one lesson. So maybe we need to change or modify or I can add information in. I can give them homework. It's basically a platform that me as a teacher and you as a student, you can both see those uh, see that information, see those cards, and those cards or those kind of um, notes can be shared really easily. And it's just a nice interface. You have everything on one page. You can go through, you can plan, and you can kind of you know map out your um, your teaching, map out your students' uh, learning, their um, learning plans, etc. for the week. So I think that's a really good one first and foremost. Second one is Calendly. Why do I say Calendly? Well, it's just a calendar with an L-Y, Calendly, because a lot of challenges a teacher's face is I have students in different time zones. I have students in different countries. I even have students in the same country in different time zones. So how do I manage this? So Calendly is fantastic. You just have one link. You set up one link as a teacher with your time zone. So if you were in, I don't know, let's say if you're in Vancouver, you'd have Pacific time. And that would be set as your time zone. So when students want to make an appointment or they want to book a lesson with you, they can just click that link. And that will then set the time to where they are. And they can choose 
uh, a time based on your availability in their time zone. So essentially, once that's set, you can see a time where you are, they can see a time where they are, then when you meet, they're matched up together. So there's no confusion with daylight savings time. I've had a lot of problems with daylight savings time where the time's changed here in my country, but it hasn't changed in their country, or it changes after one week where they are or two weeks. So these are real issues and they, they can really affect students' learning and affect, you know, if you're, if you're working for yourself, can affect your ability to make money. So being organized with tools like Trello and Calendly are great. Um, and then just finally, one more that you mentioned, Golnaz, was Mentimeter. So Mentimeter, again, nice tool, similar to Kahoot in a way. Um, you can set questions. You can ask for responses. It's more about responses. So maybe you can do it at the beginning of the class. As a warm-up, you could set a few um, you know, questions on Mentimeter, for example. So what did we learn last lesson? Or what do we want to learn this lesson? Or what was, um, you know, what was a word or a phrase that you're still not comfortable with? So we can use it as a lead-in and a nice, fun way for students to open up a new tab on their browser or you know, open their phone and just quickly sign in, get interactive. And if we have a few different students as well, again, we can share different answers. We can share different ideas um, in there. You can type short answers as well. It's not really a game as such as, com as compared to Kahoot, but again, it's a really useful tool as well on there. Um, so yeah, organizational tools, Trello, Calendly, and Mentimeter are just three that we would suggest for you to use. I also would want to add another website, uh, which is uh, Busy Teacher. If you just Google Busy Teacher, you can um, find the link to it. Uh, this is also a very good website for um, finding worksheets, different types of worksheets, like on all different topics and all different levels. Um, it is it is really useful. You can just find um whatever you want and whatever you need for any level for any classroom and i know that today teachers are literally busy so you can just use busy teacher to help you a little bit with that with the load of work you have okay so um there is another question that we have to ask um and it is that um it is not easy to use technology it is not easy to just say okay let's use technology and let's just get tech savvy and let's just um digitalize everything so uh we have some struggles we all have some challenges with it now how can we manage this change and this transition to new technology and this new teaching style and what downsides might there be? Uh, how can we approach this? How can we kind of cope with this and use it to our benefit and to our learners' benefit? Yeah, it's really tricky to you know manage this transition because it takes time. You know, new things take time, and especially when you know, the pandemic hit, we didn't really have time to adapt. We just kind of had to sink or swim in some ways, and that created a lot of challenges. Some people obviously flourished and did really well, but others not so much. Um, I think what it comes down to, again, as previously mentioned, is organization. Um, if you organize your tools and your resources, you know how to use them and you're comfortable with them, then that's great. Um, but, you know, for example, things like PowerPoint, it's a very old style. It's a very old way of teaching. But having that as a skeleton or as a frame to develop the rest of your lesson and other parts of your lesson, it can be really useful. Um, I know a lot of teachers think, well, I have to make slides. It takes a long time. It's a little bit, you know, time consuming for me for just a, a one hour lesson or a 30 minute lesson. But just having three or four slides for your learner to see, to visualize, to kind of, you know, check, it can be invaluable. And then also you can embed your videos and embed your activities and your links in there. And then again, you're going through the process with the student. Um, if we just speak without any visuals, it can be quite difficult for the student to, or the learner to understand everything you're trying to tell them. Of course, they're listening. Of course, they're trying. But, you know, especially with younger learners or lower level learners, it could be an issue. So having and starting with a good, you know, PowerPoint or Google slide just to catch their attention, to get them, you know, interested and get their initial motivation is key. Having resources to support that learning and having interaction, gamification within that as well is another really useful way. So it's kind of a one, two, three approach. Have your outline, have your skeleton with your PowerPoint or your Google slide. Add to that some resources for practicing, for developing, for homework. And then finally, add in some interaction 
some little games, some little quizzes, etc. And you can also achieve all this organization through the tools that we mentioned, like Trello, like Calendly, and then like Mentimeter in the lessons, just for feedback, just for checking, and then for improving that process. Just like for our students, learning English is a process. For us as teachers, planning and delivering lessons is a process, and we'll get better at it and we'll improve at it as we go on. Exactly. And I also want to add that um, let's not let technical issues uh, frustrate us because uh, it is a part of our lives today. Uh, wherever we go and whatever we do, not only in classrooms, in online classrooms, but like everywhere with everything. So uh, let's just kind of adapt and let's just uh, make our peace with it. And uh, this is a part of our lives today. Let's just um, if it happens, it happens. It's okay. We can just carry on and move on with it. And, you know, um, we can also help our students feel kind of comfortable with this technical issues. Okay. It happens. No problem. We can find a way to kind of manage it and, um, actually, uh, not let our classroom and not let our plan get wholly ruined only because of technical issues or other types of difficulties. Absolutely. Just like in the classroom, when we're teaching face to face, there can be problems, there can be issues, there can be some lessons that don't go well. That's going to be the case online as well. Technology is not going to solve all of the problems. But again, if we manage it right, if we're organized and, you know, we're very clear in our approach, then that should help us to be successful. So we're going to have our guest, Kelsey, join us now for our interview. So we'll see you over there in the interview and we'll get started with that now. Welcome, everyone, to the next portion of today's podcast. Today, we have Kelsey with us. Um, Kelsey, welcome to our podcast. How Thanks are you? Thanks for having me. Okay, so why don't you start with introducing yourself a little bit? Our listeners would want to know more about you. Yeah, sure. My name is Kelsey, as you mentioned. Um, I'm currently a teacher and teacher trainer working in Turkey. I've been here for the past five years. Uh, trying to get my fingers in as many projects as possible at the moment. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really appreciated. And also really interesting to hear uh, a teacher from Turkey. So hopefully we can learn some of your experiences and some perspectives today. So the first question is obviously related to technology. This podcast uh, episode is all about technology. So in your classroom, within your practice, Kelsey, how often do you use technology for teaching? Are we talking about now or uh, pre-corona? That's a great question. Well, yeah, I guess we could start with before and then now. If that, that would be a good comparison, I think. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Before, I think I used pretty standard technology in terms of, um, you know, really basics like PowerPoint, projectors, stuff like that, lots of videos. Um, but I think also some interactive technology was always on my radar. And then now, um, every day I'm online and trying to find new platforms and new ways of engaging students and teachers and bridging the gap, uh, the physical gap that might be between all of us. Great. And do you actually incorporate technology into your lesson planning or is it just something that comes kind of naturally now? I think now it comes a lot more naturally, but at the beginning and, and some of my best advice for teachers uh, that I work with is that it's almost the foundation of your planning. If you have um, an activity or something that you want to run, you have to know what technology you're going to use and how that's going to run. So I almost always start there with, with what platforms do I need and, and how do I want the class to look. And um, in general, how effective do you find using technology for teaching? You know, and also, how important do you think it is to use it in classes, online or face-to-face? -face? I love this question. Uh, <laughs> it took me a little bit to come up with an answer. And I think it really depends. I'm sure so many people would say the same thing. But in my opinion, it depends a lot both on who you are as a teacher and who your students are as learners. So for me personally, I find it really effective. I find that I'm able to do everything I want to do. I find that uh, my lessons can translate online really well, but I think that's because I not only have access um, to a lot of technology, but I've practiced a lot 
And then my learners are really, they pick it up quickly. They're engaged with that as well. I don't think it's a blanket thing that's effective for everyone. Um, and so I think it's equal um, with how comfortable you are with tech and how comfortable your students are. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think you've reached a point now where students and also us as teachers, we're pretty much reliant on that now. Is there ever an example where technology doesn't work or it doesn't kind of, you know, go the way you've planned and you have to find something else or find this a backup activity? How do you how do you all manage that? <laughs> all the time. Um, yeah, I think it's the same as, you know, pre-pandemic. If, if something didn't work, you have to be flexible. You have to change what you're doing. And that is definitely true now. And now it's all about technology. I work currently on CELTA courses, and I would say almost every day um, my candidates run into some issue with technology. So I've built up a very large bank of practical solutions and, and ways to get around that, and that comes with time. Um, but yeah, always having a backup plan, always knowing that you can do an activity in a different way or being ready to just scrap that activity altogether if it's, if it's frustrating. Those are good plans. Okay, so um, to give a little bit more, uh, let's say, details and information to our listeners, um, what platforms, programs, or websites have you had experience with that have worked well in your classroom, or maybe uh, any platforms or programs that you might want to recommend to our listeners? Yeah, I teach primarily on Zoom. Uh, I taught on Zoom before the pandemic, and I, I continue to be primarily based on Zoom in terms of the uh, basic program that I use to teach, I find it really intuitive, really helpful. I think there's a huge resource bank of videos that you can watch and a lot of people are using it. Uh, I personally would love to get more into Adobe Connect because I think a lot of the frustrations with Zoom can be solved with that, but it's much more demanding on the teachers. So I personally haven't gotten into that yet. And then in my lessons, um, I'm a, I'm a fan of two websites primarily. One is Padlet and the other one is WordWall. Uh, and the reason I like these is I think between the two of them, any activity you already have for a face-to-face -face class, you can create it online. Um, they're both free to a certain extent. You can just delete old activities. Um, and I think they're really helpful. I think in general, just choosing one or two uh, websites and focusing on them and then developing your skill set on that website and making sure you really understand how it works. That's been what's been most helpful for me. And have you found that obviously during the pandemic that you've kind of leveled up your skills with a lot of different softwares and are you kind of making more videos and kind of making kind of more work than you would in the past? I, I definitely found that in my experience. Would you agree? It's the same for yeah. you? 100%. It is 100% a fact that uh, I spend much more time and effort and energy teaching online than I do teaching face-to-face. -face. I think part of it is that you have to get your head around the new tech. You have to make sure you're comfortable. And we as teachers might be a little bit, uh, we might be perfectionists. We might want to make sure that everything is right and everything is perfect. And so we, we dedicate a lot of time to that. But I think even after you get over that learning curve, you're still um, having to spend more time. You're having to teach your learners how to use it. You're having to give feedback online. I think everything is just a little bit slower online. And do you have any recommendations for teachers specifically who would like to become more tech savvy in their teaching, you know, because, well, as you said, there are a lot of struggles, a lot of challenges. It doesn't work well all the time. But uh, especially for those teachers who are kind of transitioning to this online system and online working and everything, do you have any suggestions for them, any advice, any, you know, anything that might make them um, feel better? in doing this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the first thing is just to, to be a little brave. Um, I think we tell ourselves that we're not good at something or we tell ourselves that we can't do something and I don't find that to be the case. I've worked with many teachers um, and a lot of them say that they're not comfortable with technology and at the end of a five-week course, they are managing everything like a pro. So just sort of letting go of that idea you have about yourself is the first thing. 
But a little bit more practically, um, I think there's two really important things that you have to do. And one is to take the time to practice. Um, just click random buttons and see what happens. Uh, it's, it's not a bomb. You're not going to mess anything up. So um, play around, see what's there, go through the settings, um, take an hour and just explore because I think a lot of platforms are trying to be as user-friendly as possible. But you have to sort of still work through all of it and see what you can do. And then the second um, tip, I guess, is to just try something new with regularity. So whether that's every week you try something new or every class you try something new, um, you know, our, our students are not guinea pigs, of course, but throwing in a new activity and saying, hey guys, I'm still learning. I want to try this. Let's see how it goes. Um, you're going to find some really cool things and some things won't work, but uh, you will continue to explore and, and you have a, a good audience who will help you out with it. Great. Um and just one kind of related question to that, would you advocate, especially nowadays, for teachers to just basically move all of their, you know, notes, their resources, everything fully online? Do you think that that's a prudent move and that's a, a wise move at this stage? Or do you think there should always be some paper-based elements to your kind of teaching practice, your administration, et cetera? Wow, that's an excellent question. I've never thought of that. Um, <laughs> I think if you have the time and the space to do that. I think that's a wonderful goal. Um, starting potentially with what's most important to you and, and most relevant. I will kind of add though that I'm a very paper-based thinker. So I actually, my own tech setup is two different computers and they're, they're linked. Uh, I have programs that, that can make my wireless mouse work on both PCs, um, but I still have a pad of paper in front of me and all my notes that I take during each lesson are on paper. So for me personally, I cannot be 100% digital, um, but I would also love if all of my work was stored in an organized way online. So if any of your listeners are really tech savvy and uh, I could pay them to do that for me, <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. So just one more question, Kelsey. Um, obviously, working as a SALTA trainer, I'm sure right now there's a lot of challenges and a lot of, you know, new ways of working with everything kind of being online. And maybe as a, a new teacher or someone thinking about becoming an English teacher, what advice, what information would you give them? Um, you know, what's maybe one thing you might suggest to them at the moment in order to be successful and be able to transition into teaching English online? Um, I'm just going to summarize your question to make sure I understand it. So someone who is thinking about being a teacher now has never been a teacher before. Is it about uh, something specifically yeah. or about how to sort of get into the, the online teaching? So probably because I know, I know a lot of teachers now who are teaching online, they want to kind of level up their skills. They, they maybe they have a TEFL and they want to do a CELTA or they think that CELTA is kind of like the, you know, the, I don't know, this kind of golden ticket i would say so yeah for those teachers who may be thinking of pursuing that or you know looking for that yeah what would you kind of recommend how could they be prepared or what's something they should probably need to know perhaps mm -hmm. well first at the risk of sounding like um you know the standard marketing line i've been working on celta nonstop since april of 2020 um so it's been quite a few courses and i think what people get out of CELTA at this moment is actually two courses because we cover exactly the same thing and then you also get this really practical experience online. Um, and I think the reason why people think CELTA is, is that golden nugget, to borrow your phrase, is that it's so practical and you get so much feedback. So I advocate this for anyone, um, new or experienced. I think that we as teachers are the best source of professional development for each other. So gathering um, in a group and talking about the problems we're having technology or otherwise is such a great use of our time. And the, the benefit of many of these online platforms is that someone can come and observe your lesson from anywhere at any time. This has been a huge barrier, I think, in my own professional development is that I can't just have a friend come pop into my lesson 
all the time and give me feedback. But when we're teaching online, I think it's much easier. So in preparation for CELTA or as just pure professional development, observing others and being observed is really going to prepare you um, for further development or, or give you insight into your lessons from another perspective. So that would, I think, be the, the number one piece of encouragement I would have is, is get into other people's lessons, watch them, see what they do, see how they do it. It won't always be the way you would do it, um, but, but you'll certainly learn a lot. Great. Thank you so much. That's a really, I think, a really useful um, piece of advice. And I think a lot of teachers underestimate the power of feedback and how how much of a profound effect it can have on your practice and your pedagogy as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kelsey. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelsey, for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you. So that was today's podcast about technology and how it can help us uh, teach more effectively. We also would like to know about your experience with it and the the effects of technology on your teaching. Also, if you have any questions that you want to have about this, we would love for you to ask us your questions and get in touch with us. Our email address is esltalkpodcast at gmail.com. And remember, you can also follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook. Just search at ESL Talk Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us again today, guys. And we'll see you in the next episode. Stay safe, guys. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe for new episodes and to follow us on Instagram and Facebook for even more ESL teaching content.